All right, I'm going to cover the treatment or management of atrial fibrillation, and I think someone else is going to cover maybe the uh, pathology of it as well as uh, issues of cardioversion. I will mention cardioversion where it's appropriate to talk about the treatment. So the things, there's really five things you have to consider when you're managing somebody with atrial fibrillation. You want to ask, do they have hemodynamic instability? So in some cases, atrial fibrillation can cause uh, somebody to not get blood pumped properly. And it doesn't usually happen or always happen, but in some cases it does. So if you have your heart and up here's the atria. The atria is fibrillating. It's just barely uh, um, moving and, and pumping. It's not really pumping. It's just uh, fluttering. And you got blood coming in, flowing in from either side, from here from the lungs and here from the venous return. If that last kick of the atria is to push the blood, the last 30% of the blood, down into the ventricles, and if you don't get that last 30%, then, um, then it's possible that you're not getting enough blood for the ventricles to go ahead and push it out to the rest of the body. You're reducing your cardiac output, and so you can have hemodynamic instability from that. And some of the associated symptoms with hemodynamic instability would be like ischemic heart problems. You could have um, is, you know, ischemia to the other tissues, the brain, hypoperfusion, uh, and, and any type of thing with cardiogenic shock. Pulmonary edema would be another thing to think about. So those are, that's the first consideration, the most important. If there's hemodynamic instability, in that case, you're going to admit them. You're not going to work them without patient. You're going to go ahead and admit them to the hospital. Then the next thing is your severe associated symptoms, and I mentioned some of those already, and severe associated symptoms are typically due to hemodynamic instability, but there's a few others. The third thing to consider is the heart rate. So uh, rate control is more important than rhythm control. Rate control more important than rhythm control. You remember uh, from back in physiology that you want to have, you want to maintain a certain cardiac output. And cardiac output is determined by your heart rate multiplied by your stroke volume. So heart rate times stroke volume is equal to cardiac output. So regardless if the rhythm is crazy, the rate is still going to determine the cardiac output. And as long as your cardiac output is, is good enough, then you can move on. If it's not good enough because your heart rate is messed up, then you want to go ahead and address that if the, if the heart rate is too high or if it's too low. Once you've maintained rate control, you're going to look at the etiology, what's causing it, what are some possible causes, and you'll do some lab workups, and I'll go through what those labs are. And the last thing you're going to think about is the timing. How long has this been going on, and what does that mean for the treatment? All right, so this is probably the most important slide as far as big picture. So just remember the five things. Hemodynamic instability, severe associated symptoms, heart rate, etiology, and timing. Okay, so suppose somebody has hemodynamic instability. I already told you you're going to admit them to the hospital. And then the second thing to think about is that rate and rhythm control both supersede the risk of thrombi. We'll talk about what the risk of thrombi are in a moment. But you, if you're not going to worry about anticoagulation as long if it's going to interfere with controlling the rate and rhythm. And cardioversion is... is implicated, strongly implicated when there's hemodynamic instability. It's, it's not something where you're like, yeah, we should weigh the pros and the cons. It's something that this is the pros. You're going to stay alive or, or you probably could die. And if you don't die, you're going to have severe uh, damage to different organ systems. Now, some of, the hemo, some of the things that hemodynamic instability are associated with, like I already mentioned, ischemia, heart failure, which you might see pulmonary edema, or any type of uh, symptom of cardiogenic shock. And then other thing that you want to think about is pre-excitation syndromes. So, for example, Wolf-Parkinson-White, if you have that uh, an accessory electrical pathway and the atrial fibrillation is being conducted down to the ventricle, and you have the, the ventricle basically going into flutter or fibrillation because of that, then you're going to have no blood pumping at all. And so that's an associated symptom you want to be aware of. And so just as a reminder for anybody that may have forgotten already, it, typically you have your, your SA node and it conducts electricity to the AV node and then that electricity gets conducted to the rest of the heart. With a pre-excitation syndrome, you have some type of alternative pathway. It can be anywhere, but an alternative pathway that's also going to be able to conduct electricity. And with atrial fibrillation, that electricity will just be able to pass down through there and it won't be 
dampened by the, the AV node, so the AV node will actually pick and choose how fast it'll allow signals to come through where accessory pathways won't. And so if you have AFib with an accessory pathway, you can literally increase the heart rate um, indefinitely or up to fibrillation of the ventricle. So uh, the articles that I've read and, and stuff that I've read on this, there's, it, they always seem to point out there's a difference between indiscriminate cardioversion versus rate control. I don't know, maybe this is uh, associated with an older debate that no longer is going on. Um, the idea is that rate control supersedes rhythm control. Um, and the ideal rate, if you have symptoms, if, you, like, if, if the AFib is actually causing problems and symptoms, the rate you want to get down to is 85 per minute. If there are no symptoms, then you can be a little bit more lenient and allow a rate of up to 110 beats per minute. Okay, and there's exceptions to everything, right? So if there's hemodynamic instability that's being caused by the, the, the atrial fibrillation, then you want to control the rhythm and the rate equally, or they're equally important. And in some cases, the fibrillation is actually causing the rate control so by fixing the fibrillation you'll fix the rate automatically and so then in that case cardioversion becomes more important than rate control so I guess I should mention really quick since I've, I've said this word a few times what cardioversion is cardioversion is just something to cause the rhythm to go from fibrillation back to normal sinus rhythm that can be done either by electrically shocking or with medications such as antiarrhythmics so there's my electrical lightning bolt and there's my pill Okay, I'm not going to go huge into what the causes of AFib are, but the treatment, the management, does require you to look into possible causes. And so the common first labs and first tests that you're going to order will be associated with the common causes of AFib. So uh, congestive heart failure, you're going to check for B-type natriuretic peptide or pro-B-type natriuretic peptide. Um, you also want to look for uh, other types of pulmonary problems that could indicate CHF. And you can do that by auscultating, checking diaphragmatic excursion. You look for uh, possibly like pneumonia or um, atelectasis on x-ray. Another common cause would be hyperthyroidism. And so you check the thyroid function test with TSH, T4, those kind of things. Electrolytes to check for renal functions and other idiopathic causes of electrolyte abnormalities. Um, and then, of course, ischemia. So if you have a heart attack, uh, you can actually create a new electrical pathway. So, so let's say that this is your heart, and here's your atria up here. You have, a, let's say, an infarct up here. Whenever the electricity gets to here, it has to go around this way, and it has to go around this way. And so it can create this circular area where the electricity can flow in a circle around each other and chase itself and keep re-exciting the heart. So you want to check for cardiac enzymes. If this is a new acute onset AFib, you want to check the cardiac enzymes. If it's been a long-standing AFib that nobody's really taken the time to look into, you want to look at the ECG for past evidence of MI. Then other labs you're going to want to get, well, you want to get a CBC. And one thing you're going to be looking for on the CBC it would be something like anemia. You want to do transthoracic echo. Notice I didn't say transesophageal at this point. At this point, it's a transthoracic echo to look for structure and also a chest radiograph. And then finally, what got cut off down here is you want to check their past medical history and see if there's any other associated uh, uh, illnesses or pathologies that could also explain AFib. Okay, so timing. We talked about timing, and when you read into atrial fibrillation, this 48-hour cutoff is going to be mentioned a whole bunch of times, and let me just give you the gist of it. If you want to be successful in your cardioversion, whether you do electrical or, or medical, whether you do electrical or pharmaceutical, if you want to have successful cardioversion, your best chances are within, are first of all, on the first uh, time that the AFib is diagnosed, you have a good success. If you wait a while, less success. But within that 48-hour window is your best chances, and also it's going to determine your need for anticoagulation. So if you catch a person within 48 hours of the beginning of AFib and you do the cardioversion, you may not necessarily need to anticoagulate before you do the cardioversion. If it's after this 48-hour window, then you're going to need to anticoagulate for up to three weeks. So I'm going to put anticoagulate greater than or equal to three weeks. 
This can be done uh, typically with one of the newer oral anticoagulants such as a DREC10A inhibitor or a DREC thrombin inhibitor. But the exact uh, anticoagulant that you're going to use, that's going to depend on how long you think that they're going to need to stay on the anticoagulant and the cost as well. So you want to think about the patient centered. What's the cost of the anticoagulation going to be? What's follow up and, and check in going to be? And then, and then how long is it going to be? If it's going to be just for those three weeks, then probably one of the newer 10A uh, inhibitors would be your best choice. So how are you going to know if you caught it within the first 48 hours. If somebody walks in your clinic and you do a 12 lead EKG and you see AFib, do you know that you caught it within the last 48 hours? And the answer is you're not always going to know. Sometimes it's going to be unknown. When it's unknown, you pretend like it's greater than 48 hours and you do the three-week treatment. But if it's known, the one, one way you can check for that, if they just started having symptoms, they just started having problems that day or the day before, then you can look at their, their past medical histories, look at their old EKGs, look at their old um, uh, physical exams and workups and see if there's any evidence that maybe that atrial fibrillation has been going on longer. Okay, so uh, before I do anything else, let's say, let's go through a scenario and say we got somebody, their first, uh, the first time they're having AFib, it's within 48 hours, are we going to use anticoagulants? And that is going to depend on their risk of stroke. So again, if, if you're over 48 hours, you anticoagulate for three weeks. If you're less than 48 hours, you go ahead and do the cardioversion, but in, even in that case, you can still anticoagulate, and that will depend on their stroke risk. And I think Evan's going to talk about stroke risk with the Chad Vask score. Or the, there's, there's some two different scores you can use. You can use the, the Chad's 2, or you can use the Chad's Vask, which is CHAD2DS2-VASC. And I think um, I'm not going to go into what those are, but these are just scoring systems to see how likely you are to have a stroke. Okay, so there's two questions with cardioversion. The first question is, do I cardiovert? If the answer is yes, the second question is, what method should I use? Because you have two options, electrical and pharmaceutical. And UpToDate recommends, now this is the most recent recommendation, but UpToDate recommends that you have at least one attempt especially if it's their first presentation. And it gives you five or six good reasons why, but they all boil down to two things. You can actually improve quality of life even in an asymptomatic patient. So patient comes in, they have an AFib, they say, yeah, my life is just fine, I just got this AFib and palpitations. You cardiovert and they, they uh, convert back to normal sinus, sinus rhythm, they'll actually come in and report improvements in quality of life. So quality of life scores go up. The second thing is that waiting actually reduces the odds of it working. So if you wait for too long, you actually may not ever be able to get them to convert back to sinus rhythm. And I said there's a caveat to everything, right? So when do you recommend against it? Uh, whenever they're completely asymptomatic, especially if they're old. But if they're completely asymptomatic and they're like, you know, I just don't want to or I don't want to pay for it or I don't have the insurance and I'm asymptomatic, you're like, you know what, we can watch and wait. Um, we'll just anticoagulate you and see what happens. The other thing is, especially if they're over 80 years old, so over 80, it's probably not going to be worth it because you're typically going to see other comorbidities that doing a cardioversion will exacerbate. Now lastly, if you go back in the past medical history and you look at past 12 lead EKGs, you look at past physical exams and they have strong evidence of AFib for greater than three years, then you don't want to, especially if they're symptom free. So it's symptom free and evidence over three years of AFib, then you don't want to do it. And some evidence you can look for is marked dilation of the left atrium. So what does that mean? You remember the, you have two ways in which your heart can it can hypertrophy. It can hypertrophy, so like this is the heart wall right here. It can go from being this thick to being this thick. So it can hypertrophy in thickness, or it can go from being like this volume to being this volume. So the wall didn't actually get thicker, it just kind of expanded. Now the wall's out here. And that actually has to do with how the, the heart is laying down new myocytes, how the myocytes are actually growing. So you remember you have your sarcomeres and they overlap. And if they start adding new sarcomeres outward, then you're going to get 
uh, you're going to get growth in width. If they actually start laying down new sarcomeres in, in circuit, then you're going to get um, expansion in volume. The rule of thumb is pressure, I'm going to put pi for pressure, pressure overload leads to width, growth in width, and volume overload leads to growth in, in volume. So you're going to get growth in volume from volume overload. That's not always true, but that's the general rule of thumb. So what is growth in volume? What do we call that? We call that dilation. And if you have marked dilation of the left atrium, then that's evidence that you've had AFib for a long time because you're not pushing the volume down. You have your heart here. Here's your atrium. If you have volume coming in, but you're not pushing it into the ventricle, then eventually that's going to result in symptoms of volume overload. Okay, second question. Do we use electrical or pharmaceutical? First episode, they always recommend electrical for the first, and it's because you have a higher rate of success typically, you have fewer uh, relapses, uh, but then when do you recommend pharmaceutical? If you already are planning to give antiarrhythmics long term, go ahead and treat the AFib with an antiarrhythmic. If it's paroxysmal AFib, typically paroxysmal atrial fibrillation will go away on its own whether you treat it or not. The only reason you would treat it is that you're concerned about how long it might last. And so you go ahead and treat those pharmaceutically as well because there's no, no need to be invasive whenever it will probably go away on its own. And then the last thing to consider in making this decision is your own personal comfort level if you're the one doing the treatment. I have the entire class 1 through class 3 recommendations on what pharmaceuticals to use. Class 1 are the ones with the greatest evidence, then you have class 2A, class 2B. 2A are like, yeah, these are probably really, really good. Class 2B is these might be really good, and class 3 is like, these don't work. So you remember in class 1, these are the class 1 recommended for uh, cardioversion, and I believe our patient this week got propafenone. I believe someone else is going to present the actual pharmacology on the, on the drugs, so I'll uh, let that go. Last thing, there's other considerations. So after you do a cardioversion, if you do it, or if you choose not to, you just choose to go ahead and anticoagulate and see what happens, you're always going to want to do a follow-up within one week, and if they can't make it in a week, you do it at the earliest possible you can after that one week period. Um, so hospitalization in several cases we talked about. Ablation is also an option. Now, I'm not going to go into uh, ablation very much. I'm just mentioning it for completeness sake. And then lastly is referral to a cardiologist or electrophysiologist. And these are other things that you should probably look into in the case of an AFib, but I just don't have time to mention that to, to go into them.